Hello, everyone. Welcome to Warrior Church. Thanks for joining us this week. We are excited here at Warrior Notes. We have a, a good message for you. And this week, we're going to talk about the blood of Jesus. And the title of this one is It Was Enough. And that is The Blood Was Enough. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. As we come to you, we glorify you that your plan of salvation has been accomplished, that Jesus came and he was a victorious warrior and bought us back. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is strong. Wrong. And I thank you, Father, that on the earth we are mighty. We are mighty and we are many. And I thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit is, is rising us up and we are experiencing and encountering your goodness and your love. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And uh, Holy Spirit, have your way. Yes. Amen. Okay, we're going to get right into it, and thanks for joining us. Make sure you tell all your friends and all over the world, just get as many people as you can to come to these, these uh, short Bible studies. This is great. This is ex exciting that we can do this through media all over the world. And we have um, oh, probably 15,000 students, right? Right. That's At this time, 15,000, 16,000 students almost. And so at the time of this, this recording, so... Here we go. Um, in Hebrews, which is a really, really cool book. So if I were you, I would read the book of Hebrews as much as possible because there's something supernatural about that. In fact, there, there are um, no indications uh, really who wrote the book of Hebrews. And we can guess who, who did, but it's not known because it's, it was a, a letter that was not signed by an author. But it's really supernatural. In fact, I read through Hebrews before every time I preach. I go through and I, I have it on, um, on audio too as well, the scriptures. But Hebrews does something for me all the time. It, it goes through a whole bunch of different really cool things about, about, about salvation and about angels and about God. But the, the blood of Jesus is really mentioned a lot. So in Hebrews 9:14, I'm going to read from the Passion Translation. It says this, Yet how much more will the sacred blood of the Messiah thoroughly cleanse our consciousness? From, by, for by the power of, etern, of the eternal spirit, he has offered himself to God as the perfect sacrifice that now frees us from our dead works to worship and serve the living God. Okay, so here... Here, we, we know that the blood of Jesus was sacred and we know it's powerful, but it's also perfect. And this word perfect is used in the, in the book of, of Genesis where Noah went into the ark and he, it says that those eight people were perfect. Noah was perfect in his generations, Noah and his family which is his genetics. So the, we know that life is in the blood because it says that, that in, in the, uh, in the uh, Moses, when he was, was up on the mountain with God, the Lord showed him about the sacrifices and how to institute everything in the tabernacle. But it says that life was in, in the blood. And so we know that the bloodlines are very important because of what happened in the book of Genesis chapter 6. We have... Uh, the inner breeding going on to where the seed of the serpent was getting into the bloodline of human beings and then the whole earth was destroyed except for Noah. So Jesus was really the, the one who bought back humanity as a perfect lamb that was not genetically flawed in any way. So when Mary had Jesus through the Holy Spirit, we have a perfect body that Jesus was given, and so when he was sacrificed, he was perfectly 100% human, and he didn't have any of this bad tainted blood in him, which was what was happening before the flood. Okay, so that that word perfect is really one of the most important things because Satan was going to go to God after he infiltrated through all the bloodlines, so all those genealogies in the Bible are there to prove that Satan, the serpent, never got in to the bloodlines, that everyone stayed pure the whole way to Mary. So we, we understand this because we talk a lot about this in our conferences, but this word perfect is very important because Satan was hoping that he could get that, that seed of the serpent into human beings through the hybrid races so that after Jesus died on the cross, he was going to go to heaven and say, I got gotcha, you, Father. 
um, Jesus was not uh, totally human because I got in here, here, and here, and so he's blemished, so he's not a perfect lamb. And so Jesus made a fool of him, made a show of him openly, triumphing over the cross because he was perfectly human and he was also perfectly God, of course. Okay, so the word perfect is really what I want to focus on. That, that sacrifice frees us. It completely frees us from the, the, uh, the law, obeying the law. I mean, think about it. You can't be good enough. You can't obey all the laws. And, you know, we're always in our weakness. We can't fulfill the law. We can't do everything right because of our weakness. But in our weakness, Paul said that we're made strong because the Spirit comes in and, and super intercedes, it says in Romans 8, 26. In the, in the Passion Translation, it says super intercedes, comes in and takes hold of us and lifts us up and in our weakness. And so Paul understood this. The book of Hebrews says that this blood frees us so that, that we, can, we can worship God freely and have the fulfillment of the law through that precious blood. So we're, we're, we're completely exonerated of our past sins when we accept Jesus as Lord. Okay, it, going on in Hebrews 10, verse 19 in the New Living Translation, it says this, it says, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Now, it be enough that we can enter in, but it says boldly, boldly enter in. That, that would mean that it's without it's without having to request an appointment because it says that the, the veil is rent and we have access to the Holy of Holies. So it, Jesus was a new and living way into the Holy of Holies. The veil isn't even in place now. It's gone. Mm -hmm. and, and I know that. So we all have access to that through this precious blood. So that holy place... That, that wonderful place where the Shekinah glory was, the, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the atonement, the, 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 the seat that was there, the mercy seat with the, the golden cherubim and where the blood was placed in the center there uh, and the glory of God was in, in there, in that, in that place, that is open now to us. We're, we're allowed to walk in there. And I, and I remember this because Jesus said, listen, even after Adam and Eve fell in the garden, I came down. They were in a sinful state. I came down and wanted to know where they were. And I stood and talked with them. He said, then when Cain messed up, I came and talked to him and tried to talk him out of it. And I started to see that even in a man's fallen state, they were still way beyond what we can, we can imagine today. Yeah. That's how far we've fallen, yeah. is that they still in sin lived a thousand years. Wow. You couldn't kill man hardly. That's how powerful the position that God made us in originally. Okay, so because of that, if we've been given this new and living way, then the only thing left that hasn't been that has not been defeated, that has not been dealt with, is physical death. So we still die physically, yeah. but we don't die spiritually anymore. If we are in Christ, we stay in Christ, and we walk in the Spirit with Him. Uh, we have we really are secure if we stay in Christ. I mean, we're in the secret place. So this this idea. Of the, of the Holy of Holies being opened up needs to be preached more. And you need to tell people, listen, you know, this is a, this is a way that's been made for us. We're restored back to way, the way Adam and Eve were before they sinned. But even after they sinned, think about this. We can't see the face of God and live. That's what it says. You can't see it. But Adam and Eve did. In their sin, they did. And they lived. But they, they were dying physically now. But, but that's how far we've fallen. So that is why all the genealogies are in the Bible is to prove that there was a lineage that stayed clean. And it also shows us that, that uh, the, the super, the su above and beyond condition of original man, that, that maybe that is why uh, 
when, when we get into talks about the, the hybrid races and things like that, why there was probably the line, the godly line of Seth up there at the top probably was not allowed to touch certain lines that had gone down through Cain because they had fallen in, in a, at a quicker rate than the sons of God that had walked. Because Seth lived a long time. The sons of Adam, they, they lived a long time. It's kind of funny because you don't think that, but there are all kinds of people that lived and died, and Seth kept living. <laughs> Yeah. And these people were living and dying and having many children, and the the original line kept living. Adam lived to 930 years, Methuselah 969. So we have these people that are living a lot longer, and this is because the the genetics weren't flawed as much at the top. Okay, so when Jesus came, he was perfect in his gen genetics. Then, then. Um, was the perfect sacrifice. So we we should not be thinking about our past sins. We should not be feeling guilty and condemned. We should either be forgiven or we're not forgiven, but we are, right? We're all forgiven, right? Okay, okay. W with that being said, we get into this aggressive, aggressive place now where we've, we've, we've gone into the Holy of Holies and this is our home. We don't have to knock, we, the veil is gone. Then in Revelation, it gets, it, gets, it gets kind of aggressive with the blood. And this is, of course, where most churches won't go. But you guys are brave enough. I think you can handle this, a warrior church. So here we go. Revelation 12, 11 in the New King James says, And they overcame the Antichrist. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto death. Okay, there's three major things here none of which uh, is spoken of en enough. So I'm, I'm going to talk about it in the last couple minutes here as much as possible to make up for those who are not brave enough to talk about this. But they overcame the Antichrist by the blood of the Lamb. Okay, so that means that Jesus' perfect blood is speaking, and it's very powerful. And we already know when we're filming this, we've, we've, we're 2,000 years from the cross, Okay, and we don't know how many years it's going to be from now until uh, the Antichrist shows his face and these saints that are alive then have to confront him and, and come against him. Mm -hmm. So you understand it. We don't know how long it's going to be. It could be months, years. It could be decades. You know, it could be a couple hundred years. But the lamb, the blood of the lamb is how they overcame the Antichrist, okay? It also says that the word of their testimony was the way they overcame the, the Antichrist. They came against him with the blood of the Lamb and their testimony. Okay, two things there. And then their attitude was they did not love their lives unto death. So they were willing to die for this. And uh, this is not popular at all, but, you know, it's part of the gospel so, you know, you, you, you have to adjust yourself because I had to. The Lord said, is what you're believing for worth dying for? And I thought, well, I don't need that new car that bad then, you know. <laughs> and I don't need, you know, like in other words, it, would you die for what you're believing for? He asked me that. And I said, well, no, but I would die for you. And so... I would die for my wife, you know, I would die for Kathy, but I wouldn't just, you know, I wouldn't die for a car or, you know, or what. So anyway, the Lord will check you with this, but they did not consider their life as being so valuable that, that they would preserve their life in the case of standing up for their testimony and using the blood of Jesus as their, as their, an aggressive uh, weapon, you know, so they counted not their life. And so anyway, uh, this is, gets more aggressive, right? And this is not passive. So it's funny how when you get in the book of Revelation, everything's more aggressive than, and, uh, you know, when you talk about the book of Acts, I mean, they were getting beat up sometimes weekly for just talking about Jesus. They were told, hey, hey don't mention that name anymore. Don't preach in that name anymore. And they beat them. And then they go back and they, they said, we need to pray for boldness. They pray for boldness. And they went back into the street and yeah. started preaching again. Right? Yeah. But, you know, the, to, today it's like, well, you know, you get thrown in jail because you 
you know, preaching on the street and you get thrown in jail, then it's like, well, maybe I'll just uh, use YouTube or, you know, maybe I'll just do media, you know, but, but these guys, they would go right back to the street and get ready to be beat up again, you know, and, you know, what, 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 uh, what is in a person that would do that, you know, but it's something maybe that we should consider, uh, you know, as we get more, more into the end times, be a little bit more aggressive, you know, this, um, then Jesus also, uh, to finish this off in Luke, 20 verse 22 in the new king james says he took this cup at the last supper and he said this cup the new covenant in my blood which was shed for you so he's telling his disciples listen this is my blood do this as often as you meet in remembrance of me because i'm about to to shed my blood and that blood he even said if you don't drink of my blood and eat of my flesh you have no part of me in other words you have to take all of him into you and you have to you have to have communion with him. It is all about the blood, and his blood was enough. So anyway, let me pray for you, and we're, we're, I want you to discuss this among yourselves. What the blood of Jesus really means to you. Discuss these things that I that I talked to you about about how um, the whole idea throughout history, throughout the whole Bible, is about the bloodlines and about uh, the, the, the sacrifice being perfect and about the, the Holy of Holies and how sacred that was, but that yet, you know, talk about how God loves us and trusts us so much that he's telling us, you, you can come right in. You can come right in the Holy of Holies now. And he showed me that we're, we have the same privileges that Adam and Eve had before the fall. We just don't live forever like they did. We still, that's the only enemy we still have is death, physical death. So let me pray for you and discuss these things among yourselves and just talk about the blood of Jesus and make the devil really upset because he does not want you to talk about yeah. the blood of Jesus. Father, I thank you that the, there's power in the blood of Jesus. And I thank yes. you that we are washed in the blood and that we have full access into your place, of, your holy place. And I thank you, Father, that we will go in there and commune with you. It's a sacred place. We take communion and we acknowledge what you've done, Jesus. And thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And thank you for healing our bodies and delivering us from oppression of the devil. And I thank you for freedom, Father. I thank you for everything you've done in the name of Jesus. So we are forgiven. We're forgiven, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Well, God bless you, friends, and we'll see you next week on Warrior Church. God bless. So it's just you and me again. No problem. So this week it was enough. Uh, and it says here, yet how much... Hey, by the way, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yet how much more will the sacred... And you could hear the video too, right? Yes. Okay. Yet how much more will the sacred blood of the Messiah thoroughly cleanse our consciences for by the power of the eternal spirit he has offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice that now frees us from our dead works to worship and serve the living God and let me double check okay all right so then Kevin's notes here uh, the blood of Jesus is sacred and we know that the blood is powerful but it is also perfect. The word perfect is used in the book of Genesis when it talks about Noah. The Bible says that Noah and the people that accompanied him were perfect. Noah was perfect in his generation and his generic, genetic family line. In those days before the flood, there was interbreeding happening, and the seed of the serpent, Satan, was getting into the bloodline of human beings. The whole earth was destroyed except for Noah. We see that Jesus was the one who brought back humanity. He was the perfect lamb that was not genetically flawed in any way. When Mary had Jesus through the Holy Spirit, 
The body Jesus was given was perfect. When he was sacrificed, he was perfectly 100% human, and he didn't have any tainted blood in him. Satan planned to go to God after he infiltrated through the bloodline. In the Bible, the genealogies have proven that Satan never got into the bloodlines. So everyone remained pure up to Mary's bloodline. Satan was hoping that he could get the seed of the serpent into human beings through the hybrid race, so that after Jesus died on the cross, he could go to heaven and say, I got you, Father. Jesus was not totally human because I made my way in here, here and here. And he's blemished, so he's not a perfect lamb. Jesus instead made a fool of him and made a show of him openly triumphing over the cross because he was perfectly human. Jesus was also perfectly God. Jesus' sacrifice frees us from the law and obeying the law. You can't be good enough. You can't obey all the laws because we're always in our weakness. Therefore, we can't fulfill the law. We can't do everything right because of our weakness. But Paul said, in our weakness, we're made strong because the Spirit of God comes in and super intercedes on our behalf. See Romans 8.26 in the Passion Translation. In Hebrews, it says that this blood frees us so that we can freely worship God and have fulfillment of the law through the precious blood. Jesus also fulfilled the law through the blood and we're completely exonerated of our past sins when we accept him as Lord. So the first question, in what ways has Jesus saved humanity? How has the blood of Jesus caused you to be free from the law? See Romans 8 as a reference for discussion. Pull that up. Romans 8. Well, I know the first verse is going to say there's no condemnation in those who are in Jesus Christ. Okay. So, Jesus saved humanity. Uh, and you, jo ex Jehovah's Witnesses, you guys already know this because we heard it in the Kingdom Hall multiple times that the Israelites had to sacrifice animals because there was no sacrifice of Jesus before that, before he was sacrificed. So they had to kill, keep killing animals for the uh, remission of their sins. And so by Jesus coming and dying. Once for all of us, he saved humanity and delivered us from the law because uh, the sacrifice of one God is enough for infinite beings. And uh, yeah, so that answers that question. But let's go to Romans 8, see uh, if, if it mentions any, it probably does. Okay, it says in verse 12, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged and condemned by the law. For it is not those who merely hear the law who are just or righteous before God, but it is those who obey the law who will be justified. When Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things the law requires, they are a law to themselves, though they do not have the law. And then it goes on to talk about how the Jew is condemned by the law. Because, and, and they rely on the law for their salvation. And it says in verse uh, 18, and if you claim to know his will and approve the things that are essential or have a sense of what is excellent based on your instruction from the law, and if you are confident that you are a qualified guide to the blind, those untaught in theology, a light to those who are in darkness, and that you are a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the spiritually childish, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth, well then, you who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? Hold on a second.
Well, that goes on to uh, answer that question. Let's move on to the next one. All right, Hebrews 10, 19 in the New Living Translation says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. We have direct access to the Holy of Holies because it says that the veal is rent or torn. Jesus is the new and living way into the Holy of Holies. The veal is no longer in place. It's gone, and we all have access to that through Jesus' precious blood. Getting the opportunity to enter in would be enough all on its own, but it says we can boldly enter in. Boldly enter in would mean that it is without having to request an appointment. That holy place where the Shekinah glory was, the Ark of the Covenant, the Atonement, and the Mercy Seat with the Golden Cherubim, where the blood was placed in the center that is open to all of us, and we're allowed to walk right in. Jesus said, even after Adam and Eve fell in the garden, I came down. They were in a sinful state, so Jesus came down and wanted to know where they were. Then when Cain messed up, he came and tried to talk him out of it. Even in man's fallen state, they were still way beyond what could ima what we could imagine today. And what Kevin's referring to is... Um... And you know what? You know, before I, I go into this thing, um, I've heard from people that aren't even born again that have found... Uh, like footprints of the, the giants that lived before the flood, they were hypothesizing that, I don't know exactly how the right words are, but they were saying that things were a lot lighter back then. And that's why like clay heart, like they were able to find footprints because um, they say that that the st the stone that the footprint was in was so soft it had to have been super soft or well something happened with the way our world something happened with the flood right that changed everything and so things that were softer then are hard now and that's why like you'll find extremely hard rocks that have footprints um because they were saying that the only way it could be soft enough for a foot imprint would be if it was like it was just cooling off from what being molten lava so how could it be uh that this stone that everyone cuts you know for like furniture has a footprint in it the person obviously wasn't walking on burnt on 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 rock that had just exploded out of a volcano and I heard Kevin talk about this before, and I've heard uh, him say that the, the the blocks for the pyramid that Enoch built, the Pyramid of Giza, were not as heavy as they are today because of because of the flood. And so, going back to the point he made here, even in man's fallen state, they were still way beyond what we could imagine today. And, and remember, Kevin went to heaven, and this is. Uh, information he got in heaven so it doesn't have to be in the bible for us to talk about it um he said that adam and eve and cain they were they had well adam and eve had access to realms that the only way they are accessible today are through through witchcraft magic astrology etc all the, the all the forbidden practices Adam and Eve didn't need to pull out some stupid board to have a demon tell it stuff. They could, they could, they were living in these realms as well. And they could see spiritual beings. They didn't have to, uh, I guess you, like today, like they say, they can see uh, ghosts through special cameras. Like our eyes could see them be back be, before the, fel the fall. So right after they sin, um they're able to see she's still able to see jesus christ the face of god without dying so it goes on that's how far we fall in is that they who are still in sin lived a thousand years you could hardly kill a man back then that's how powerful of a position god made us in originally we've been given this new and living way and the only thing left that has not been defeated or dealt with is physical death we still die physically, but we don't die spiritually anymore because we're in Christ. The key is to remain in Christ and walk in the spirit with him. We are secure if we stay in the secret place.
We've been restored to the way Adam and Eve were before they sinned. We also can't see the face of God and live, but Adam and Eve could even in their sin. The Lord showed me that we have the same privileges that Adam and Eve did before the fall. We just don't live forever on earth like they did. The only enemy we still have is physical death. That shows us how far we've fallen. All the genealogies in the Bible to prove that there was a lineage that stayed clean. That Jesus, uh, that sentence is kind of confusing. The godly line of Seth is listed at the top. Seth just kept on living, which could be because the genetics weren't flawed at the top. The original bloodlines just kept living. Adam lived to 930 years. Methuselah lived to 969 years. When Jesus came, he was the perfect sacrifice with no flaws of any kind in his genetics. He made it so that our past sins are non-existent, so we shouldn't be thinking about them. We are forgiven. And Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to, to the death. All right, they overcame the Antichrist by the blood of the Lamb. Jesus' perfect blood is speaking today. The, they overcame the Antichrist by the word of their testimony. We are 2,000 years from the time of the cross. We don't know how many years it's going to be until the Antichrist shows his face. It could be months or years. It could be decades. It could be a few hundred years before the Antichrist comes. The saints that are alive when the Antichrist comes have to confront and come against him. They will not love their lives unto death. They are willing to die for this. It's not a popular choice to die this way, but it's in the gospel. They did not consider their life as being so valuable that they would preserve it. In the case of standing up for their testimony and using the blood of Jesus as an aggressive weapon, they counted not their life. They would get beat up for talking about Jesus. Then they would pray for boldness to get back into the streets to preach. If that happened today and you were on the street preaching and got thrown in jail, you'd get out quickly and probably <laughs> probably start a YouTube channel. These guys would go right back out into the street and get ready to be beaten up again. In these end times, we should consider becoming a little more aggressive and bolder in our approach to sharing the gospel. So is, is what you're believing God for worth dying for? Would you lay your life down for him? Do you value your life more than what it takes to be bold in sharing the gospel? What is your feeling towards death? Do you fear it? Discuss eternal life. Okay, so like he said, uh, no, I wouldn't die for a car or a job. And yes, I would die for Jesus Christ. I hope everyone listening would too. And do you value your life more than what it takes to be bold in sharing the gospel? Do you value? Yes, I do. And feeling towards death. Uh, man, I mean, like, I don't want to, like, nobody wants to die, but then it's like, You, you know what happens after death, but then you, you kind of fear it because you're like afraid of dying. You know, um, my biggest fear is like, like, I'm not going to name these people. Uh, there's a person I know that he's so convinced that he, he was right with the, he's right with the Lord. And he won't listen to uh, anybody. And it's like, he's so self-deceived. And if he died, you know, it's like, that's the thing that scares me. It's like the self-deception that you die and then you end up going to hell thinking you were right with God, you know? <laughs> That's why we need humility because you got to be able to listen to anybody. The Lord will speak to you through anyone. You have to you have to hear. Anyways, uh likewise he also took the cup off after supper saying, 
This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Jesus is saying, this is my blood. Do this as often as you meet in remembrance of me. He is also saying, I'm about to shed my blood. If you don't drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you have no part of me. So um, it doesn't say there, it doesn't say there, if you don't drink of my blood and eat of my flesh, you have no part of me if you're one of the 144,000. <clears throat> right? Do you guys understand that point? You have if even if you're coming out of Jehovah's Witnesses right now and you're confused about doctrine concerning the memorial and partaking of the emblems, it, it doesn't say here that that if you don't drink of my blood and eat of my flesh and you're part of the 144,000, then you have no part in me, right? Because the governing body is telling you that, that that scripture is towards the anointed and it's not talking to the great crowd. Well, it doesn't say that here. He just makes a general statement. So if, you, if you're still believing that you're not going to heaven and you're going to live on paradise earth for eternity, is if you were reading this scripture without all of your watchtower doctrine, According to this, you and you don't partake of the emblems, you have no life. You you have no part of Jesus Christ. You're not going to paradise because you haven't partaken of the emblems. You have to take in all of and have communion with him. It is all about the blood of Jesus and his blood was enough. All right. Uh, what does the blood of Jesus truly mean? Go in depth. Go in depth about the blood of Jesus. It makes the devil upset when we talk about the blood of Jesus. I'm glad it makes him upset because this fool, this pure, this moron, thought that he was going to deceive. He, they, I mean, think about it. Think about this. God knows everything. Jesus Himself said that the Lord knows how many hairs are on our heads. Okay. So this idiot. Satan thought that he could deceive the master of the universe, the one who created everything, invisible and visible. He really thought he was going to go to the throne and, and, and say, gotcha. So stupid, man. So stupid. I, I just amazes me that, that an angel that was living on, in heaven and was in the pres presence of, of God, of Jehovah, could think something so stupid. So, um, why are the bloodlines in the Bible so important? Why was Jesus' perfect sacrifice so significant? So, um, the reason the bloodlines are, the generations from Adam to Mary are listed in Matthew it's because it's there to prove that Jesus was fully human. And uh, Jude references the book of Enoch. And um, the book of Enoch is like a whole prophecy. It's hu a huge portion of it is just prophesying Jesus Christ. And so the Jews, especially the Essenes, had the book of Enoch in their presence. Uh, I think... It, because the oldest version of the book of Enoch is that we have, right? Because if you read the uh, Testament of the Patriarchs, they, the book of Enoch was the Bible before Moses came. And that's what people were reading was the book of Enoch because Noah brought it with him through the ark. And so, uh, but the oldest version that we have is like two to 300 years before Christ. And then Jude references a straight up, Copy, he copy and paste a, a couple of verses out of the book of Enoch. And, uh, and we know that because, again, the book existed before Jude was written. And so the Jews, they all knew about the, uh, the hybrids that were um, – the and, and the way that they, they would refer to them in Israel was called the Raphaim. And um, – I think it's, let me pull this up real quick. Oh, man.
Rathlame graveyard. There's a grave. There's like a. There is an area near Israel or around Israel or in, in Israel that they were. Um, it's called here. It is called the Valley of the Raphaim. It's descended southwest from Jerusalem to Nahal Sorek below it. Hold on. It served as an ancient route from the coastal plain to the Judean hills. And so according to biblical lore, there are a lot of like buried uh, giants in this valley. Or people haven't, if, if it wasn't that, I, I remember reading that spirit, people have encountered spirits of giants somewhere around there. That's why it gets that name. Um, and the giants were hybrids. And the all the wars that David fought and all the wars that the, the Israelites with Moses through Joshua, through the judges, through S Samson, up to David. All of the, those were the Nephilim wars, all those wars. In fact, even Abraham, Abraham was also uh, slaying giants too. From Abraham to David, all those wars in the Bible were against hybrids. And that's why God was like, you can't marry these, these women outside of Israel because you're going to contaminate your bloodline with the serpent's bloodline. If you read Genesis 6, it says that the giants were in the earth after the flood. And that's why God's like, you got to even kill the babies, the infants, the animals. You can't take anything because it's all contaminated genetically. And uh, that's why you got to take them all out. And so the Jews uh, and G Goliath was also one of these hybrids, you know, um, and so David took his uh, his giant skull, buried it. They kept it with the, uh, according to legend, or it's buried with the Ark of the Covenant. And then when Christ, this is like amazing, this part right here. So, you know, Christ was crucified on Golgotha. That means, it's called also called Skull, I think it was Skull Mountain. And the reason it's called that is because they knew the Goliath's skull is buried there. And Golgotha means Goliath of Gath. So when Jesus is hanging on the cross bleeding and the earthquake starts, his blood goes down through the cracks. And his blood literally drips on top of the Ark of the Covenant and on the skull of Goliath that are hidden. This is where it's hidden. Okay, I've heard that it's going to be revealed that the Lord's waiting to reveal the ark uh, when and during the times of the Antichrist. And so um, that that's why Jesus' perfect sacrifice is so significant. That's why the bloodlines are super important. And that's what this UFO deception right now is about. Those spirits that died in the flood and people, hybrids that continue living right now and that they die, they're not fully human. Their spirits roam our planet. And they're trying to deceive people into believing that UFOs are, you know, extraterrestrials and all that stuff. And it's all a lie. It's just the spirits of the hybrids. And most of them died in the flood. Describe how sacred were the holy of holies in the Old Testament. Let me make sure. Uh, Kev I think Kevin's referring to, uh, yeah, the Shekinah glory. So, yeah, so. Um, you know, again, that goes back into what I was talking about, how the blood of Christ fell on the Ark of the Covenant. And remember, if you read uh, Exodus, only the descendants of Aaron were allowed inside the uh, in the um, the tent where they kept the uh, Ark until they built the temple. 
And that's where the Shekinah glory was. And it's still there wherever the Ark of the Covenant is. That's why, like, okay, from what the story I read, like, this guy that discovered it, they the FBI found, found out about it, and they sent people in there, and they never came back because um, when the, the only people that are allowed to go in there near the Ark of the Covenant, and remember that a Jew, the one who touched the Ark, when uh, he thought it was going to fall and he fell dead. That's, this is all related to the Shekinah glory. So um, if you're not uh, a descendant of Aaron, you will literally die. <laughs> and that's what happened to the supposed FBI agents that uh, went in there when uh, it was discovered around the 70s by this archaeologist. And that's why it, ha it doesn't come up because these secret agencies they know that if they can't send people in there and they keep it a secret um and so anyway so the high priest they would tie a uh, rope to his waist and a bell and as long as they could hear the bell they knew that he was alive because if you didn't execute all the rituals of the high priest correctly then you would drop dead that's how serious this was. And so um, what happened was if the bell stopped ringing, then everybody outside, right, outside of the Holy of Holies, they would, they would hear that the bell stopped ringing and they would know that the high priest screwed up and he's dropped dead. And so then because he's, his, he's tied to a rope, they could then pull his body out of there and then bury him. Super scary stuff, man. I'm glad I'm not a high priest of Aaron, related to Aaron. All right, now discuss the Holy of Holies. Now that Jesus accomplished what he did on the cross, he loves and trusts us, and he's saying, come right in. Yeah, so he delivered us from the law, and uh, honestly, maybe maybe a born again Christian could get near the ark and not drop dead because because we're born again, and it's like being a high priest. Okay, so we'll go, go ahead and close the prayer for week twenty. Uh, Father, I thank you that there's power in the blood of Jesus, and I thank you that we are washed in the blood and that we have full access into your holy place. And I thank you, Father, that we will go in there and commune with you. It's a sacred place. We take communion and we acknowledge that what you've done, Jesus, and thank you for shedding your blood. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins, and thank you for healing our bodies and delivering us from the oppression of the devil. I thank you for freedom, Father. I thank you for everything you've done in the name of Jesus. We are forgiven. We're forgiven, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you.